Welcome. I am Judy Turba, and today I am absolutely delighted and honored to be interviewing Mr. Thomas Kunkel, highly regarded former president of St. Norbert College, prolific writer, and author of the newly released Man on Fire, The Life and Spirit of Norbert of Xanten. Tom, welcome. Thank we you. We are so glad to have you with no, us. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you. Super. And also joining us are two young and inspiring Norbertine seminarians, Frater Jordan Neek, who will be ordained this summer. Congratulations, Jordan. Thanks, Judy. That's awesome. And Frater Jonathan Turba, third year seminarian here at St. Norbert Abbey. And as his aunt, <laughs> I find such joy in watching the journey toward priesthood unfold for him. Tom, I have to be really honest. I've been involved in Norbertine institutions for 34 years. I'm a graduate of St. Norbert College. I've read plenty on Norbert and the history, but I have never found a document so intriguing, so inspiring. It's beautifully and clearly written, and I think just as importantly, it's accessible. It's an awesome read, and when I put it down, I realize this saint is absolutely as relevant today mm. as he was yesterday. And what a gift you gave us, and well, from what well. I hear, you gave also every single graduate yesterday at commencement services at St. Norbert College this book. Well, uh, it's true that every graduate got the book. Um, what's not true is that I gave it to them. Uh, I, uh, in fact, I objected to that. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I, I thought that was a lovely gesture. That was uh, a decision that the college made. And, you know, and, and I, once I heard it, I thought, well, that's really... Um, what an extraordinary gesture, not only was very generous of them, but just to send um, the graduates out with this um, book, which, hope, which one hopes that after four years of, of inculcation in Norbertine culture and values and tradition that, you know, they uh, can read it and then, you know, maybe have a deeper appreciation for the, the person that that uh, where it all where it all began, so that was that was wonderful, and they seem to be very excited about that. Um, and and I just want to say thank you for the kind words. I tell people sometimes everybody's opinion matters, but some people's opinion matters more than others. And if you were finding things in there that you didn't know or or were re revelatory for you about Norbert, then I feel like maybe we we hit the mark. Maybe. Well, thank you, Tom. I did. It was truly a wonderful read so what a gift what a gift thank you and of course the three of us are kind of chomping at the bit to ask you a whole lot of questions and i think one of the first ones is that for many people in the world norbert it's not a familiar saint to them right and i'm so curious what drew you to spend years researching and writing about this rather obscure saint well, I think it's true that even American Catholics, they, they don't really know St. Norbert. Uh, and they don't, and, and many of them, of course, don't really know the Norbertine order. And I, I was a lifelong Catholic, but until I was pulled into the, recruited into the search for the presidency of St. Norbert College in early 2008, I really didn't know the Norbertines. And of course, it's, it's in part because, it's primarily because in, the, in North America, the presence is not, you know, they're not like Franciscans, they're not like Dominicans, they're not like the Jesuits, the presence all around the United States. They're very well known, you know, here in this area, of course, for obvious reasons. But, uh, you know, it, and, and so, and so then, you know, in coming to St. Norbert and starting to do some preliminary research, you know, I was so taken with the order and its tradition and almost the accidental way that they got, you know, to North America in the first place. But the, my journey with Norbert, the person, began a couple years later. I think uh, my wife Deb and I were, had just finished my second year as president. And as you know, the college uh, annually has a, we call it a Norbertine heritage trip, where college administrators, trustees, senior faculty, uh, friends of the college will go and spend a couple of weeks in Europe at Norbertine sites. And, and that was our first occasion to do that. And 
literally about the fourth day, I was thinking, you know, this man was so extraordinary that I, and I began to think, we, we could really use, I was thinking like a monograph, you know, the idea of a short book that would explain, well, who was he? What was he? You know, how did all this start? You know, try and put this into some context. And I, I literally, on the back of the bus, where we were going from place to place, I started making notes. And, uh, and then fast forward several years when I was in position to retire, we still needed that book. I still had those notes. And uh, I just thought that wouldn't it be fun and helpful to spend the first part of my time away from the college, you know, pursuing that. We thought from the beginning, we were thinking about a book that could be a first year book for students, could be a book that you would give new faculty and staff, trustees, just anybody who knew enough about the Norbertines to be interested, but maybe didn't know anything about the man. So how daunting was this task? The man left literally no, nothing of his own in writing. How did you go about doing Well, that's this? the hardest part. Um, the good news about this was that, uh, I mean, I've written a number of books, including some other biographies, and, and in those, you know, part of that was doing a lot of original research, and I did some original research here. The trick for this, and what I wanted to do all along, there's, there's been 900 years of scholarship, much of it intra-Norbertine, mm -hmm. about Norbert, mm -hmm. but it wasn't really intended for a, a general audience. So there was a lot of material, but a lot of it had been, you know, needed to be, you know, translated, or mostly it just needed to be taken, collected, evaluated, and and what I wanted to do was tell Norbert's story in a in a you know a, a brisk, a complete, but a, you know, brisk and accessible way. And so mostly what I was doing was taking authoritative information about Norbert that existed through the years but usually in translations, usually for an academic or an Orbertine audience, and try to write about it with a, a more general audience in mind. Right. And I was so taken, one, I love your phrasing, but I particularly love this part. You state that Norbert led a life that was rather unpredictable, emotional, and messy, and that he was as much, and I do like this, this part, power broker as a priest, as much a troublemaker as a prophet, as determined or stubborn, if you will, as he was devout. Right. Can you tell us more about that? Those are quite, quite. You know, one of the reasons, eyes. thank you. I, I think one of the reasons I was so taken with the, Norbert the person is that uh, even though he lived a millennium ago, he, he struck me as a very modern um, person or sensibility. Uh, he, you know, you could ascribe a lot of characteristics and qualities to it, but if we look at what he did in, in today's parlance, for starters, he would be, um, you'd call him an entrepreneur. Yes. Um, you'd call him, you know, a world-class communicator. Uh, you'd, you might call him a power broker. Uh, but you would also notice a strong strain of, of contradictions and also a strong strain of someone who when you know, thought he knew his own mind, and probably did at the time, but invariably he had the sense that there was something around the corner. There was he was always, whether he was intending to or not, he was always sort of expecting or looking for the next thing, and and it was all in a good cause. I mean, but one of the reasons that I think he accomplished so much in a relatively short amount of time is he was always open to every possibility, mm. even if he mm. wasn't seeking out that possibility, and he may have been, but I just thought, he's just, just to me, that's just a really modern kind of, you know, person. He had, I think he carried around a lot of guilt. I think he carried around a lot of uncertainty. Uh, on the other hand, he was very confident, maybe even when he had no business being confident. <laughs> and uh, I just, so that, 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 you know, that ball of contradictions uh, to a biographer, I think is uh, uh, very appealing. Oh, because uh, you know, I think a lot of saints, you know, saintly lives. I mean, they're wonderful. I mean, they wouldn't be saints, but I don't. Most of them aren't quite this messy. I don't think. And the fact that it was a bundle of contradictions was, you know, a great part of the appeal for me. And just you keep pulling back layer after layer after layer, and uh, with each separation, he just seemed more interesting. Right. 
and given this fascinating man, I, I look at the two of you realizing you are joining the order founded by this saint. And after reading the book, is there a takeaway? Is there something that really resonated with you that you will take with you as you journey through priesthood? And I don't know who wants to start. All right, I would love to. Um, so to me, I guess, what spoke to me most as I read it was what were you, you were just talking about a bit, Tom, there, about peeling away layers to find the person of who Norbert is. I think, I feel that in any person trying to find a vocation, it's daunting. I mean, talking to age mates of mine who are um, married and looking to have children or getting their family started that, you know, like, wow, this is more than I thought and I don't think I'm set up for this. It's a very much a similar mentality of joining a religious life, of thinking, um, you know, this, this made sense, but then there's challenges along the way. Sure. It's easy to, to doubt oneself. And so reading how you wrote about Norbert in such a, a personal way made it very relatable for me. Mm. So I found a lot of relief in that, to be honest, of recognizing and remembering, oh yeah, don't put Norbert on this pedestal yeah. as a perfect person. He was a human person. And, and to re let that invigorate my continuing search and my discernment as I continue to grow into this vocation. I think that may be a key takeaway for anyway, whether you're anybody, whether you're talking about, you know, like these young men that have chosen the Norbertine life oh. or just people that want to, to live a Norbertine existence. But I think it's too easy with Norbert or any saint to imagine them on the pedestal. And of course, all the tradition and the hagiography, it all keeps him on the pedestal. But, but, but to find the, the real guy uh, and to get permission to know that he had, you know, he had issues like the rest of us, I do think is, is reassuring. Mm -hmm. How about you, Jordan? Yeah, what, what I really found profound about your book, Tom, Man on Fire, is the biographer's interpretation of these events. Uh, what I find so fascinating in history today, like most historians are trying to uncover these stories which can paint historical figures in a positive or negative light. And as a biographer or a historian, trying to get to the root of what's going on here. Uh, like Jonathan and I taking even classes in scripture, scriptures written centuries before us, and yet it's still relevant today because it speaks of the human condition. I feel Man on Fire speaks to the human condition of Norbert, and that makes it relatable of how, you know, Norbert is a saint, um, but he's also human like you and I, and what's going on in between the lines of the historical facts. And what I love about about Norbert is he speak to um, his saintliness. If I may, I, uh, Jonathan mentioned uh, one of the scholars that I relied heavily on, and that's a gentleman, Father uh, Wilford Grauen, who is a, a Norbertine in um, Postal uh, Abbey in Belgium. And uh, I, did, I did just want to say this uh, man who's still alive, and I think still working, although I think he's in his, into, well into his 70s, but he um, has done, he's the foremost authority on Norbert. He literally has spent his whole life, you know, finding out about Norbert. He published a, a book-length dissertation about Norbert's later life. And then he, after that, then he went back and he started researching, you know, the first parts of Norbert's life, uh, which wasn't published, but I had access to. And, and it just, uh, and he did it with great uh, scrupulousness, but also he's a historian, so he just, he, he's not interested in the hagiography and, and the myths of history and tradition, but what really happened? Was he really there when we said he was there? And uh, I, I just, you know, I just, wanted to say for the record how important that there was much material I was able to draw on, but that was uh, so significant and uh, is a huge contribution to Fantastic. Norbertine studies. Yeah. Fantastic. Wonderful. Tom, you also share that at the time of Norbert's death in 1134, there were about a hundred Norbertine abbeys and foundations. Right. And then by some accounts, mid 14th century, perhaps over a thousand. Right. I mean, this exponential growth and you state that the Norbertine order would stand as one of the most robust examples of early Catholic renewal of religious life. What would have been so appealing at that time to have attracted so many followers in that short of time? Well, one of the reasons that we ultimately wanted to call the book Man on Fire was in part to get at this sense of, uh, you know, I think at some point in the book I used the phrase that this thing was spreading like a fire in the wilderness. 
Uh, and it really, truly was. And remember, this was, uh, you know, the early 1100s, so, you know, not exactly, you know, digital media age, you know, and he was getting around on foot and donkey maybe, and yet uh, word about this man and this movement was literally racing around Europe. And I think, it, I think there were a number of things, there were a lot of things that were coming together at this time. It was, the, it was in the heart of the, one of the first great reform fervors within the church, so, so that was out there, and these sorts of things was, were possible. Uh, the idea of religious orders was, was really burgeoning, and so that idea was very popular. There was an apocalyptic sense abroad in Europe. These are, you know, the early 1100s, so this sense of the first millennium had just passed in the, in the sense that people had that, um, you know, Christ was going to come any day now. And there, there was just this great fervor, and I think there was something that was so appealing about Norbert and his message, in large part because he spoke just to folks. I mean, wherever he went, he sought out the poor, the peasants, you know, the uneducated, the people who had the most troubles in the world. And that, of course, resonated with them. And uh, men, women didn't matter. And so I, I think, and then once it got started, you know, so the first there was Pre Montre, and then fairly quickly there was Floreff, and then there were three or four others. You could just almost feel the snowball, and uh, people who had, so, and so one of the reasons it grew so fast, because some existing com uh, communities decided they wanted to throw in with the Norbertines, uh, and others, uh, a lot of uh, the nobility, who were also in the middle of this uh, sort of spiritual self-examination decided they wanted to be part of this. And so they would pull Norbert aside and they say, well, I have a castle I'm not doing anything with. You know, if, uh, we'd really like you to start a monastery here. And, um, and it's astonishing. But, but it is true that by the time he died, so he established pre 1120, 1121. He would die in 11... 34, and by that, in that short time, there were upwards of 100 Norbertine foundations. Within a couple of years, there were upwards of 1,000, and just imagine that. And it, that doesn't happen without a, a, a great appeal and authenticity of, of message, and I think speaking not only to people's spiritual needs and desires, but, you know, where they live. And in the same way that I would imagine that when the apostles were carrying Christ's message, Forward. The reason the church grew so quickly was because it was the right message at the right time with the right people. Right. And Tom, we've talked about his relevancy, you know, that, that you know, it's just, he could be here today. I'm so curious what you think. If Norbert were here today functioning yeah. within the Catholic Church, what would he be doing and what would he be saying? He was first and foremost a reformer. And, and he was a man of action, for sure. And, and he was not afraid to speak truth to power. In fact, that was one of the reasons he was always kind of getting into trouble. Um, I mean, he loved the church, and, and he would, had fidelity to Rome, and I'm sure he, he would still, but I think his, his first impulse would, he, he would say, we're answering to a higher, a higher authority, and, and that being the case, we gotta get our act together. So I think that's what he would, it's always, it's, all, it's an interesting game, though. It's always like, you know, how would Babe Ruth do today if you he bet. was playing? So. You bet. You bet. Uh, I appreciate you answering that question sure. for sure. Could I, yeah, let me, I, I, the audience may not know that before I, you know, I went legit and got into higher education, uh, I, much of my career was in journalism, so I, I love asking people nosy questions. And in reading this book, was this basically, you know, kind of a new presence to you, or did this just, you know, you had a sense of Norbert and this just, you know, fleshed it out, and did he factor at all into, you know, your discernment? Yeah. Uh, Jonathan and I spoke about uh, this book a lot when we go on our, on our runs together, and we kind of discussed, we both studied un under Father Ted Antry at yeah. Dalesford Abbey, and what Father Ted threw at us was probably a lot of, that you had to go through a lot of sources, and what was so great about this is it took all those sources and narrowed it down into a, you know, a nice package of this is the trajectory, this is the timeline of Norbert's life. And it was fun uh, to read the book in, in that order, um, in a concise way, and draw, uh, flush out that spirit of Norbert. So even as a Norbertine that's gonna be ordained in June, this was a revitalization to me of who Norbert was. And uh, to even 
even understand the man, but also I found myself sympathizing with some of the characters in the book, uh, like one especially being Godfrey of Kappenberg, yeah. that when Norbert became Archbishop of Magdeburg, you wrote about how Godfrey almost had this uh, like downness yeah. to him as a nobleman who for, forfeit everything to the order to live a poor life. Um, I could sympathize with that man in making this decision of leaving the world behind to join the Norbertines. And I think that's where, in, in recognizing myself in that character, being like, it's more, it's more than just a human being. Like, a person will let us down. And so a vocation and call mm -hmm. is all about following God. And we are those, those vessels of God's grace. So Norbert was this vessel of God's grace to Godfrey, but Godfrey had to ask himself, is this about Norbert or is this about about God, and that's what I found uh, so lovely in reflecting on my own call. Of while relationships were important, of going to Saint Norbert College and getting to know the Norbertines, it was ultimately God who drew me here. And it's refreshing to have uh, a story now about Norbert uh, with that. A quick interjection before Jonathan answers, and that you mentioned Father Ted Antry, who's a Norbertine at Dalesford Abbey. Uh, out on the East Coast, and he he also was just a, a godsend because, as you guys know, he's probably the foremost American authority on mm -hmm. on Norbert, and so he was a tremendously helpful to me. And I think that will be a fun class to have. So I joined the ranks of those who, before I was a Norbertine, I didn't really know much about St. Norbert. I knew about the Norbertines specifically through family connections, primarily Judy, through your work with the Norbertines, mm -hmm. and so that was a connection for me growing up. But um, I didn't know St. Norbert as a person at all. So my own, you asked about discernment, my own discernment in joining the order came through, what I can now say in hindsight, um, it came through seeing others living the charism as, as Norbertines, living um, a life that Norbert led. And so one particular moment that I remember seeing was seeing three Norbertine priests at Old St. Joe's Parish on St. Norbert College campus. And being there, seeing three people together was new for me versus seeing one priest, seeing like a diocesan priest, and seeing the idea of community. So this idea of Norbert bringing people together, of wanting canons who are already living together to live under a rule and to live together. Um, I think God was speaking to me through that and seeing that, and I was speaking to parts of how I felt drawn in this vocation, to be in community, to shape one another in our formation, in our faith, that kind of a thing. So that was a part of it. Reading your book then, it really helped remind me of how important it is to allow emotion and feeling be a part of my discernment. It's really easy to start intellectualizing Norbert and to think about these are the things that he did. You touch on it in the book. Um, I start to think about his conversion as being a moment that, you know, he had a life before, conversion happens, and then life's great. Right. And that's not how anyone works. Right. And your book, in a, in a great, succinct way, touches on how that's a gradual process. Yeah, here are these moments that we recognize and are part of his story, but that's so gradual. And so it helped invite me to remember that that's my own vocational call as well, is that it's a gradual thing. And yeah. so that's, that was a real gift of that. Oh, excellent. Good. Tom, is there anything about this book that you will, that you will take away with you personally? I know you've written many, many books, but is there something particular about this saint or your journey that will really stick with you? Oh, I, I, I feel like there are lots of things. It, it, this was... Um, uh, I mean, I really feel like this was a blessing to have this opportunity, uh, especially when you throw in with the Norbertine mission, you know, in a, in a you know, significant way like you do when you, you know, become an administrator with, uh, you know, with the college. Uh, and we talk about Norbertine values and traditions all the time, but to really be able to go to the source and, and have the time and the resources, the opportunity to, to get at who that was, um, was was really a blessing for me and I was just so heartened by so much of what I found about him and, and some of it I talked about but just this sense that you know he didn't know you know he, he had this profound calling but he didn't really know to what and it took a long time to try to figure out and even when he thought he had it figured out you know then you know then he takes a turn and then you know it takes another turn but one of the things that I that I definitely carry away is even when he was seeking, even when he was searching, even when he was acting, uh, he was all in. All in. Uh, you know, he didn't do anything halfway. He, he was passionate about what he did. And I think 
So one thing, you know, that I, I carry away the sense is, that, you know, a, a lot of people, I think, you know, there's this, you know, phrase, don't let, you know, you know, perfect become the enemy of the good. I think a lot of people are waiting for, you know, everything to fall into place before they'll pull the trigger on what they ought to do. Mm -hmm. And I think Norbert was uh, a great example of somebody that's looking out there and saying, well, you know, let's get as much information as we can. This is, and then I, this is what I think we need to do. So let's go. But don't be paralyzed waiting for everything to be revealed because then nothing will ever get done. And I just think he, so one of the things that I really liked about him is he was a doer. And even if he was, even if he was maybe doing the wrong thing, he was doing it with great conviction. And then he would allow himself to change course if it, was, if it became clear that he should be moving in a different direction or he needed to amend. You know, I just, I thought he was very pragmatic. Mm -hmm. He was super smart, super smart. The, and, and, the, and the fact that he had had this uh, political education in the courts of Europe before he really became active in the church came back to really serve him well when he was establishing the order because he was able to protect his young order from, you know, so the clutches of, you, right. know, uh, you know, because he, he was smart and he had learned and he had saw the way the world works. So I just do, I do think there's, there's lesson after lesson after lesson that people can pick up, you know, from his life. But for me, I'd say, you know, one of the main ones is get in the game. Yeah. And I sense, I'm wondering whether that would be the message you would have wanted those graduates yesterday to take away. Would that have been the message? That would have been the message. Uh, I think it would have been um, look to this guy. Don't look to him necessarily as, as a model for every little thing he did, but look to him for the, va the core values that he had and the fact that he was passionate about the fact that you, you need to live your life according to those values and you need to be true to those values and even if and even if for instance you know if you're working within the Catholic Church and those values are inconvenient uh, you know you still need to be true to your values and to not be paralyzed by fear or not to be paralyzed by the possibility that you might be wrong just uh, just you know get in the game uh, I, I do think that ultimately is, is one of the key things that I, I would tell any young person today. The, you know, not many things in life last 900 years. And I don't think anything lasts, anything like that, unless what's at the core is real and true and valuable. Mm -hmm. And, and certainly, you know, I think Norbert's values were all of those things, which is why we're still here. Real and true. And valuable. Jonathan and Jordan, any questions for our guests today? I have one. I'm curious. So we've talked about the person of Norbert and, and writing that into there. So as I was reading, there were a few lines that would jump out to me where, at least from what I was observing and reading, I thought, so this didn't come from any of the resources. This was just what I would guess seemed to be where you were saying, okay, right. Norbert's in a situation. How would he have felt? So things about, you know, like, well, that wasn't the end for him. Or he certainly didn't think that that was all that it would be. Um, I loved those lines because <laughs> it just kept making me <laughs> encounter Norbert as a person. So I'm curious as a writer, how do you know when to do that? I would think so much of, I have to be historically accurate. I mean, you, you did it wonderfully in the introduction to say, you know, this is my Norbert and trying yeah. to share that. And I appreciate that, but those are great lines. So how do you know when to do that? Well, that's a great question, Jonathan. And what, I guess what I would say is any, and it doesn't matter whether you're writing about somebody that lived a thousand years ago, or you're living, you know, you're writing about somebody as I did the book before this, you know, I, I was writing about somebody who died, you know, in 1998, you know, and who I knew personally. Um, I think no one, despite how, however much record there is, nobody really knows what's going on in a person's life. And so when you undertake a, a biography, you know, you are first and foremost, you're trying to find out as much as you humanly can about what's the factual record and you know, what really happened, mm -hmm. you know, what was the framework of his or her life, who were the key players that intersected with them, what were they trying to do, were they successful, and so forth. But ultimately, you can only know so much. And of course, the further back in time you go, the less you can probably know. And so you have, there's got to be more conjecture. And I think you have, you know, if you're going to undertake to write about somebody, then I think you have to also take on the responsibility of being a bit of a field guide for your reader. 
And, and, and I think it's not only legitimate, but important that, you know, if I know that, if I know A is factual and B is factual, you know, I may or may not know for sure what the connective tissue was to get to C, but, bec but I have an educated guess. And, and I think you owe it to the reader to give them an educated guess. Now, you also owe it to them to say, you know, we're not completely sure, but then you, you see a lot of passages like, but it seems reasonable to mm -hmm. assume, or one can imagine, or it looks like this is why he did what he did. And, you know, ultimately that may not be true, but of course most readers are not going to go back, they're not going to go back into Growen's documents, or they're not going to go into Ted Antry's, you know, uh, um, dissertations. And so they're counting on you, they're relying on you to make informed judgments like that. And, but that's part of the fun because you've got that, you not only have that responsibility, but you've got that license. And you know what? If it's wrong, you know, somebody else can point it out as I'm sure, you know, will happen here, <laughs> especially as this makes its way around European <laughs> precincts. And, and uh, sure. yeah, and that's why that's part of the game. Uh, cool. Thank you. That's great. I know, Tom, you, you've spoken a lot about how Norbert can be relevant to us today uh, in, your, in your book. How have you found in creating this research or even being president of St. Norbert College, how has Norbert changed your life as a leader or as a Catholic, as a husband, as a grandfather and father? You know, I'd, I'd be hard pressed to say that, uh, you know, give you concrete examples that I, you know, changed my life in a certain way because of, um, because of things that I came across. But what I guess I would say is that at every step along the journey, uh, everything I found out about this guy, including the stuff that's not, you know, necessi you know not necessarily ennobling or, or uh, you know, positive, but they were all very human. And so I guess what I would say, Jordan, is that it reinforced for me something I already knew, but it's always good to know, and that is that, you know, we need to have license to not be paralyzed by our mistakes or our shortcomings mm -hmm. to try to learn constantly. I mean, this notion of, you know, you know education being, a, a, including of oneself, you know, a, a being a lifelong, you know, exercise. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Norbert demonstrated that because from first to last, you know, he was always making adjustments based on what he had been through or what he learned. And I, I certainly still feel that way today and um, so I think for me that was you know one of the lessons but mostly I guess I would carry away something I alluded to earlier and that is that too many Catholics you know we, we have a we have a culture of sainthood for a good reason that goes back to the you know the beginning of the church and mm -hmm. it's very valuable to us but it's also very wrong-headed and mystifying and shrouded and ignorance and, you know, or, or mischaracterizations or what. These were people. These were people who had real problems and made real mistakes. I mean, we have saints who were murderers. Um, but, you know, what they all have in common is that at some point they, they figured it out. They weren't trapped by their mistakes, but they got past them and above them. And uh, that's something that I think, you know, every human mm -hmm. being needs, somehow needs to know and figure out along the way. And um, so for me, you know, seeing this very human person, you know, having such a hard time, you know, it was, you know ironically having a hard time, but so somehow very confidently, you know, moving ahead uh, is like, yeah, that's the way you should live your life. Uh, and, and, and always, the other thing I would say is always be open to the door swinging open always be open to the door swinging open. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to go through it, but you can't live your life being afraid of the door swinging open, mm -hmm. or you just, mm -hmm. you'll never go anywhere. And boy, you know, whatever else he did, he went a he lot did. of places and did a lot of things, and in a fairly short amount of time when you think about it. Yeah. He what he really accomplished was all within the span of less than 20 years. It's unbelievable. Thank you. Tom, any other thoughts you would like to share? Is there something that you just wish could come out? I, no, nothing really leaps to mind, Judy. I would say that, uh, you know, someone might remark that if, 
if I didn't say it in 42,000 words, it probably <laughs> didn't need to be said. So, no, I really, I really do feel like uh, it was a privilege ha to have the opportunity to do and to be able to do it on my own times and own terms. And I, I will say that I'm just so incredibly appreciative, especially of my friends at the college who, you know, made this possible and who've been so supportive, did such a beautiful job, you know, with public, with producing and editing the book. It was, that was a, a real treat. I mean, it's, you know, you are a wonderful writer yourself. It, the writing is hard work and this, and this, and this is hard work, but it, uh, it was a real treat to be able to, to have that support and that uh, professional expertise along the way. So I guess I would want to make sure that people knew that. Oh, well, I'll tell you, it was just an incredible read, and we are grateful beyond words for your time here today, and especially for these thoughts and insights that you were able to share beyond the book. Um, you know, as you say, Tom, and it became so apparent in reading the book that Norbert was a person for his time, but he was also a person for all times. That became so, so obvious. So thank you so much for this gift. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Judy and, and guys. Thank you. And uh, best wishes on your, your continued uh, progress. Thank you. And especially best, wish, best wishes to you, Jordan, as you undertake uh, your journey on the priesthood. Uh, really happy for you and proud of you both. And uh, Absolutely. We're watching with great interest. <laughs> we bring, uh, Thank you. Joy to a weary world, these two. So uh, it was wonderful to have you both sure. with us. And please, everybody, Man on Fire, the life and spirit of Norbert of Zanton. Be sure to put this at the top of your must read book list. Thank you so much. Makes a great Christmas stocking stuffer. <laughs> <laughs>